happy Saturday, everybody. Not long ago, listener Tori asked if we could do an episode on the history of the peanut butter sandwich. We have not done an episode on that before, but we have done an episode on the history of peanut butter, so we are sharing that one today. And if based on what I just said, you're curious about the peanut butter sandwich, like a lot of foods, its origins are unclear, but the first written reference we have to it is by Julia Davis Chandler in 1901. Well, now I want a peanut butter sandwich. But uh, also, (laughs) uh, just to note that the FDA's final determination regarding partially hydrogenated oils came out shortly after we originally recorded this episode. And that FDA ruling removed trans fats designation of generally recognized as safe, that's G-R-A-S, for food and phased out its use in food. So if you're wondering why we didn't mention that, that's why. This episode originally came out July 13th, 2015, so enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. Hey Tracy, I'm going to start with a question. Yeah. What is your stance on peanut butter? I love it. I love it. Uh, I will say, when I'm that emphatic about it, I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression. It's not in my top three flavors, but I do love it deeply. You know, if I'm going for a dessert thing, I'm going to go more in a vanilla butterscotch caramel arena. But in terms of just day-to-day food, peanut butter is like where it's at for me. Like, I will eat it out of the jar with a spoon and call it dinner. (laughs) <laughs> for several years when I was a kid, the sandwich that uh, was required to be in my lunchbox each day was peanut butter and bacon. If you've never tried this culinary delight, I highly recommend it. It is delicious. Uh, and if you ask most people who invented peanut butter, usually they answer with George Washington Carver. Uh, occasionally they will talk about John Harvey Kellogg, who we talked about in a previous episode of this podcast. Uh, and we're going to talk about those guys and where they fit into the whole thing in terms of the history of peanut butter. But there were people mashing peanuts into a paste long before either of those names came into the picture. Before we go into the debate over who actually has bragging rights uh, to claim that they invented peanut butter, which is a convoluted tale in and of itself, we're going to talk a little bit about just how modern peanut butter is actually made. Unsurprisingly, it starts with farmers. After the last frost, so in the northern hemisphere and places that that grow peanuts, it's normally around April, uh, that's when the peanut crop is planted. Uh, And in the United States, most farmers are growing Virginia peanuts, Spanish peanuts, and runner peanuts. Peanut growers plant, on average, 115 to 140 pounds, which is between 52 and 64 kilograms of peanut seeds per acre. The seeds, which are peanut kernels, are planted just a couple of inches apart and also a couple of inches underground. So seven to ten days after uh, they're planted, seedlings begin to emerge. And three to four weeks after the seedlings first appear, peanut plants will begin to flower. And peanuts are a self-pollinating crop, and they're kind of fascinating because while they flower above ground, once they're pollinated, the petals fall off, and that fertilized portion finds its way back into the soil to bear fruit. So it's kind of odd that the flower then goes back underground, and then it becomes something edible. The process of penetrating the soil begins between 45 and 60 days after planting, and at that point, the peanut will start to grow in its vine form. This is normally when people start to use some supplemental irrigation to keep the plants healthy. And once peanuts are matured, which is about 120 to 160 days after planting, they're pulled from the ground. And in the modern uh, approach to this, there's a digger shaker, which is attached to a tractor, and it's used to cut the peanuts tap roots and lift the plants up out of the ground. This used to be done by hand, and it was very, very labor intensive and very time consuming. Uh, but then in this modern version. Uh, once the plants are, are up off the ground, they're shaken on this conveyor that's part of the big mechanism. And th- that kind of removes some soil. And it also flips them so that they're left inverted on the ground with the plant side down and the peanut side up. I'm trying to remember for sure, if because, you know, we, we grew all of our vegetables when I was growing up. I feel uh-huh. like a couple of times we experimented with planting a small number of peanuts because I remember, like, pulling up plants that had peanuts with lots of dirt underneath them. Yeah. But it's possible that that was 
someone else's farm and I was on a field trip. I don't know. <laughs> Regardless, the plants remain in the field for between two and three days to dry. And then the actual picking is done. The dried plants are pulled up in a harvester that picks up and separates the peanut part from the dried vine part. The peanuts will still need additional drying after they're harvested, unless you're going to boil them, which is delicious. Okay. <laughs> they are delicious. They are delicious, but I have a hard time getting over like the, the texture and soupiness factor. That's a problem for me. Not me. Um, <laughs> and the people that I know that love boiled peanuts love boiled peanuts. Like they will defend them staunchly. Uh, the peanuts after they're harvested are often taken to a buying station and this is where they're cleaned to remove things like any sticks and rocks that may have gotten in with the nut harvest, even though they are not technically a nut. We'll get to that later. Uh, and the farmer next takes a sample of these peanuts to federal inspection to determine their grade. And their grade is based on a variety of factors, including general damage to the crop, uh, foreign material that might still be in there after the cleaning and shaking, the maturity of the peanuts, as well as their moisture content. Next, the peanuts go to the shelling plant where the actual nuts are separated from the hull. After the shells and any other remaining foreign material comes out, the shelled peanuts go through an electric eye via a conveyor belt. The eye is an optic sorter that further separates the nuts based on their quality. And next, they are separated based on size. And at that point, they're sorted into bins accordingly. So a digital scale will measure the sorted nuts, usually into these tote bags, these giant kind of uh, synthetic fabric tote bags that are capable of holding a metric ton of content. Uh, and then the bags are taken to dry storage. And if the nuts aren't needed in the first four days after they're sorted, like if they haven't been shipped out by that point, they're usually moved to cold storage. And that would normally be set like at 38 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit or 3.3 to 5.6 degrees Celsius. Normally from this point, peanuts go one of three ways. They go to a blancher where the skins are removed so the nuts can be sold to consumers or they're exported or most importantly to today's topics, they're taken to a peanut butter plant. You can also buy peanuts in the shell which would just skip some of the steps that we've talk- talked about. Yeah. I love those too. Tracy is a great nut proponent, a great peanut proponent. Uh, so the peanuts that are taken to a peanut butter manufacturer are normally roasted and then they're cooled very quickly to stop them from cooking any further. And that helps retain their oil content. And then after roasting, the peanuts go through a blanching process similar to the ones that would happen if they had been sent directly to the blanchers. Uh, and then one last cleaning is done before they go to the grinding stage. Peanuts are ground once on their own, and then usually a second time with flavors, sweeteners, and stabilizers added. Once the desired consistency is achieved, the peanut butter goes into jars to be sealed before being shipped to retailers for uh, consumer purchase. And continuing the stories of peanuts from my childhood, uh, my, my dad worked at an organic food co-op uh, to help us make ends meet when I was a child. And he would come home with these tubs, like giant tubs of uh, organic peanut butter that you had to like stir the oil back into the peanuts. It was also delicious. Yum. Uh, now, after all the talking that we just did about how peanut butter gets made, we're keep that pretty specific to the U.S. So you might think that the U.S. is actually the most prolific peanut producing nation, but that is not accurate. In fact... Both China and India actually grow more peanuts than the United States, although a larger proportion of the peanuts uh, that are grown in the United States are used for peanut butter than is the case in either of the other countries. So about half of the peanuts that are grown here in the United States end up in a peanut butter jar. So that's how peanut butter is made. But as to where peanuts actually come from, in spite of how popular they are in the United States, they are not native to North America. No, this is an oddly lucky case of <laughs> a species being imported and not kind of getting out of control. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, peanuts are not nuts. They're legumes. They're more closely related to peas and beans and alfalfa and clover. Peanuts got their scientific name, Arrakis hypogea, in the 18th century from Carl Linnaeus. He was a Swedish botanist. The Arrakis part comes from the Greek word for weed. Uh, and the hypogea part comes from the Greek word for underground chamber. So this literally means underground weed. But they're delicious. Um, but before they ever got a scientific name, peanuts were growing in South America. 
Uh, the place peanuts are believed to have first grown is in the world's largest wetland, which is called Grand Pen- Pantanal, which I could be woefully mispronouncing. Uh, and that takes up roughly 50,000 to 75,000 square miles or 129,000 to 194,000 square kilometers in tropical areas of Brazil, Bolivia and Paraguay. Peanuts are still a big part of the culture in Bolivia, and they're used to make drinks and soaps, and they're eaten as food. But the earliest known point of peanut use is in Peru, between 3000 and 2000 BCE. There are dig sites along Peru's eastern coast that date back to 500 and 100 BCE, where people have unearthed areas where peanut shells are just scattered everywhere in enormous abundance. Yeah, I think I read one description that said it was like a, a modern baseball stadium. There were just so many peanuts strewn about. Uh, and while it was not all that much like today's peanut butters, there were some South American cultures that were grinding up peanuts and they were mixing, they were creating a paste with them and then mixing that paste with cocoa to create a sort of spread, although not as easy to spread as what we are used to. I would eat that. I would, too. It sounds delicious. (laughs) From there, peanuts are believed to have spread up the Pacific coast into Mexico, but they would make it to the American South via a much more roundabout route, which we will go into in a minute, and which people were arguing about on our Facebook page this week. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, while peanuts were brought back to Europe by Portuguese and Spanish explorers, they never kind of achieved the popularity there that they have in North America. Spanish also carried peanuts across the Pacific Ocean to the Malayan archipelago in the 1500s, and by 1608, peanuts were in China. Uh, and we certainly know that peanuts have become uh, part of many Asian cuisines, much to my palate's delight. Uh, there's evidence of use of ground peanuts in West African cuisine dating back 500 years, and they traveled to Africa, we think, from Brazil. And the the way that this was commonly prepared This sounds so delicious to me. Uh, The peanuts would be broken up under a roller, so kind of mashed, and then they would be um, mixed with honey and red peppers. That Um, sounds like an artisanal peanut butter to me. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Uh, I'm sure you could find that in a yummy upscale grocery store. From there, uh, peanuts also made their way to India in the 16th century. Yeah, so uh, it's almost like it kind of went in both directions to kind of go around the belt of the the earth to kind of make their way. They had hit Asia and then they kind of came into India from the other side. Uh, and unfortunately uh, it's thanks to the slave trade that peanuts made their way from Africa back to the Americas uh, being transported sometimes on the same ships that actually carried enslaved human cargo. Even in the United States, grinding peanuts predates the timeline most commonly related to peanut butter uh, more properly known. In the early half of the 19th century, peanuts were sometimes ground or beaten into a paste and then seasoned with salt to make a peanut porridge. But while peanut pastes of a few different types were part of cultures dating centuries back, uh, and, you know, then they had kind of become popular in the American South uh, around Civil War times, where uh, it really was the United States, though, where peanut butter, as we know it, came into existence. But before we get to the American peanut butter story, do you want to have a word from a sponsor? Sure. So getting into the tale of American peanut butter, uh, the earliest known American peanut butters were made with a combination of Spanish and Virginia peanuts, both still very popular today. Uh, Spanish peanuts have a higher concentration of oil than other var- varieties, and they're extremely flavorful. Even though peanuts themselves were considered to be a food with lower classes, the first iterations of peanut butter were really popular among the wealthy and fashionable, but that really didn't last for very long. As peanut butter dropped in price, as people got better at making it more efficiently, it became a staple of homes throughout the nation. Yeah, one uh, piece of literature I was looking at said it really was only about a 10-year timeline that it went from being sort of a new and fancy high-class food to being in almost every pantry, which is a very short period of time. But going back to the early introduction of peanut butter, uh, 
as we know it today, it is linked, as I said earlier, to a previous podcast topic, John Harvey Kellogg. And it was at his Western Health Reform Institute in Battle Creek, Michigan, that some of the earliest proponents of peanut butter could be found. And the story goes that uh, Kellogg started to grind peanuts for the patients at his uh, sanitarium who were unable to chew for themselves or that had difficulty digesting things. So it was kind of a pre-chewing concept. Uh, and eventually he switched from roasting the peanuts to steaming them to prevent breaking down the oils because he thought that was going to upset digestion. Kellogg applied for what's generally considered to be the first peanut butter patent on November 4th of 1895. Although his invention was called a food compound rather than peanut butter, it specified a manner of turning nuts into a paste for eating. He filed two more patents for similar food products in 1897 and 1898, although he later said he never patented peanut butter and thought all people should have access to it. The Sanitas Company, which he founded with his brothers, was advertising nut butters in catalogs as of 1897. Uh, another player in this this story is George Bale, who was a cracker salesman who eventually started his own snack company. And he began producing and selling peanut butter as a snack item rather than as a health food, as Kellogg had labeled it, in 1894. And Bale claimed for many years that he was the original manufacturer of peanut butter, and his advertising included that claim. Bale is sometimes being uh, credited as being one of the first manufacturers of peanut butter to add salt, uh, both to just regular peanuts and a peanut butter. Thank you, George Bale. I love me some salted peanuts. Uh, he passed away in 1921. Whether Kellogg or Bale was really the first to come up with peanut butter as we think of it today, that remains something of a debate. There's more paperwork backing up Kellogg's claim in the form of patents. But detractors point out that his peanut butter-like food wasn't as close to, quote, real peanut butter as the Bale formula was. Yeah, a lot of them point out that the boiling rather or the steaming rather than the the roasting as being a pretty distinctive variation because the roasting really does bring out a much different flavor. But regardless of who made it first, peanut butter did, as I mentioned just a bit ago, become incredibly popular, whether people were still eating it thinking that it was a health food or whether they just thought it was really tasty and a convenient snack. Uh, in 1904, peanut butter was an attraction at the St. Louis World's Fair. And shortly thereafter, Beech Nut began manufacturing it. Uh, and unlike previous versions of peanut butter that went to market in tins, Beech Nut's product was the first that we know of that was shipped in glass jars. Uh, and they continued to make peanut butter for years. Uh, Beech Nut eventually merged with Lifesavers in 1956. In 1909, Heinz also got into the peanut butter game. Heinz produced peanut butter until it was crowded out of that market in the 1950s. Uh, And then between 1903 and 1910, an agricultural problem was making its way north from Central America. And this was the boll weevil. We could actually do a whole episode on how detrimental the boll weevil invasion was to U.S. agriculture at the time. It was not pretty. There were, you know, agricultural communities that basically shut down completely. Uh, But that's another episode. However, as they pertain to peanuts, uh, once they made their way to the U.S., these beetles started noshing on the cotton crop uh, in the South, particularly where cotton is normally grown. And they really did just kind of break down the agricultural system there. And they left farmers looking for another crop that they could grow. And for a lot of them, peanuts filled that void. So people often credit George Washington Carver with inventing peanut butter and this whole bull weevil inspired switch to planting peanuts instead of cotton kind of figures into that legend. Carver was a proponent of peanuts and their many uses, and he did teach farmers, particularly black farmers, about crop rotation, although that wasn't exactly a new concept at that point. And he did write about peanuts quite a bit, although some of his claims were not quite correct. Uh, the only peanut-related patent Carver ever received was for a cosmetic made from them and not peanut butter. Yeah, and one of the incorrect claims he made was that uh, peanuts were easy to plant, grow, and harvest. And they are easy to plant, and they're pretty easy to grow, but harvesting, as I said, prior to machinery, was just backbreaking labor. Uh, and at this point, though, peanut butter was a product 
uh, that was being made, but it was primarily just for regional markets because prior to hydrogenation, the spread just did not travel well. So hydrogenation uh, raised the melting point of peanut butter so that it would stay solid at room temperature and not separate into oils and solids. Today you have to pay extra for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because, you know, the fancy peanut butter that you got to stir together costs the most. Yeah. In 1922, the National Peanut Butter Manufacturers Association, which today is the Peanut and Tree Nut Processors Association, was formed. Uh, so, okay, we're going to start talking a lot about um, hydrogenation and it, it, because it, it becomes really important in the, the story of peanut butter. So we actually want to also talk about exactly what that is. And to do that, I'm actually going to... Um, we're going to quote a passage from John Crampner's book, Creamy and Crunchy, An Informal History of Peanut Butter, the All-American Food, uh, rather than sort of try to reinvent the food science wheel, because he lays it out very nicely. The hydrogenation process consists of bubbling hydrogen into the bottom of a tank of vegetable oil in the presence of a catalyst such as powdered nickel. This isn't done at the peanut butter plant, but at a separate facility. When vegetable oil is hydrogenated, two things happen. Hydrogen atoms attach themselves to carbon atoms, and the double bonds of electrons between some carbon atoms are replaced by single bonds between the carbon and hydrogen atoms. Vegetable oil molecules with double bonds have a bent or kinked structure, so they don't stack together easily, causing them to remain fluid. Molecules with single bonds are straighter, stack together easily, and are solid. By replacing double bonds with single bonds, hydrogenation creates a more tightly packed crystalline structure in the vegetable oil, raising its melting point. So, yeah, that basically what they're saying is this makes it um, all stick together, but not become a solid. So it remains spreadable and smoother. Uh, and I feel like we should briefly talk about trans fats because they are the villains of modern nutrition and they are part of this process. They're created when the ground peanuts and hydrogenated oil are heated to very high temperatures and then rapidly cooled. And this crystallizes the fatty acids in the mixture. Trans fats, as we know, lead to arterial clogging, and that's because their melting point is so high that they can't really be burned off, like through exercise. Like you could never really work out hard enough to activate the melting of them, and for them to easily be um, um, metabolized and moved out of your body. So they tend to accumulate, and that's why people are very twitchy about them. So this whole trans fat situation might make you want to shun peanut butter, but when it's correctly made, the product only has really tiny amounts of trans fats. The presence of trans fats in peanut butter falls well below the FDA standard that would require it to be mentioned on the label. Yeah, I didn't um, double check the veracity of it, but I read one statement from a, a food scientist that said, basically, if you eat one cookie with trans fats in it, it is far more trans fats than you would get in many, many servings of peanut butter. So it really is kind of a trace amount. Uh, so now that we've got the science lesson out of the way, uh, let's have a brief word from a sponsor, and then we'll talk about one of the most important men in the peanut butter story. So a gentleman named Joseph Rosefield figures very prominently in peanut butter history. On April 5th of 1921, he filed for a patent for his process of partially hydrogenating peanut butter to stabilize it. And in 1923, he manufactured a brand called Luncheon. Uh, and this was an unstabilized peanut butter, though. In 1923 or 24, Rosefield licensed his patent to the Swift Company. And in 1924, a short-lived brand introduced by Swift was named either Dainty or Delicia. And it was making peanut butter using Rosefield's patented process. Yeah, and the reason that we're not sure of the name is there's not a lot of documentation. And uh, that information is taken from um, court testimony that Rosefield's children gave in, I think, in 1980. So it was much later and they were working from memory and they couldn't quite recall the exact name. But that's why we're not sure of it. Uh, but Swift's early effort with either Dainty or Delicia, whichever it was called, did not sell particularly well. However, they didn't abandon this idea. The company made another run at peanut butter manufacture, again using Rosefield's partial hydrogenation patent in 1928. And this is when they introduced it as Peter Pan, which, of course, became the first big brand on the market. Which is what I wanted desperately as a child when we were eating organic Peter peanut Pan. butter from a tub that had to be stirred together. Now, was it because Peter Pan was um, smooth and delicious, or was it because it was called Peter Pan? 
Uh, it was because it was like smooth and delicious and sugary and not, not so, the difference is not nearly as pronounced today, but the texture of the organic stirred together peanut butter from 1979. Yeah. <laughs> was like kind of dry and chunky and didn't spread very well. Um, whereas <laughs> like Peter Pan peanut butter was this magical sweet deliciousness. Cause it's also, there's a fair amount of sugar in a lot of, uh, and a lot of peanut butters in addition to the yeah. peanut part. So we'll um, talk about that in a minute. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I would go to my grandmother's house and she would make us peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and they would be peanut butter. Uh, they would be Peter Pan peanut butter on white bread with jelly, none of which were appropriate things to eat at our house. <laughs> <laughs> there was also another man who patented a food product just a few weeks before Rosefield, and his name was Frank Stockton. This is the first patent that actually used the phrase peanut butter, and Stockton's patent described a full hydrogenation process, which made for a less creamy product and one that was more of a solid with a higher melting point. He licensed his hydrogenation process to Heinz, who was producing hydrogenated peanut butter as early as 1923. Yeah, even when you get into kind of more in-depth stories of how peanut butter came to be what it is today, um, Frank Stockton often gets left out of the picture, uh, in part because some uh, say that his full hydrogenation process just, it made for a peanut butter that was not as naturally delicious uh, because it, it was more solid. It was harder to spread. Some would feel like it was kind of a step back in terms of, um, you know, consumer appeal. And Rosefield and the Peter Pan Company, you'll remember they were licensing his partial hydrogenation process, had a pretty significant falling out in 1932 uh, after some changes in leadership at, at um, the Swift Company, which owned Peter Pan. The manufacturer made a move to reduce the fee that they were paying Rosefield for licensing his partial hydrogenation process, and he was not having that. Uh, and the two entities went their separate ways. And then Rosefield started his own peanut butter company called Skippy. Uh, the Swift company, which again had been the parent to Peter Pan, switched to a different hydrogenation process, which was patented by a man named Leo Brown in 1932. And Brown's patent is kind of interesting because um, a lot of it really focuses on its prevention of the product sticking to the roof of the consumer's mouth. Like it talks a lot about saliva and how it will factor in with this different hydrogenation process. Rosefield further experimented with peanut butter production by setting up a lab and testing out a new system to try to get a smoother, more palatable mixture. He started churning his peanut butter rather than grinding it, which was the normal method. By then dropping crushed nuts into the mixture, he invented chunky peanut butter, which was introduced in 1935 and which I have never cared for. (gasps) (laughs) You're dead to me, Tracy B. Wilson, because I'm all about the chunky peanut butter. Um, you and your smooth Peter Pan. <laughs> I'm sticking with Skippy, I guess. Uh, Rosefield also introduced a chocolate peanut butter combo in the form of chalk nut butter, although this product never really caught on. But he was kind of ahead of his time because five years later, the Reese's Cup was introduced and it kind of went off like gangbusters. In 1955, Rosefield sold Skippy to Best Foods for six million dollars. Uh... Which also, this also is the company that makes Hellman's mayonnaise products. Yeah. Uh, so also in 1955, there was a Kentucky man named William T. Young, and he sold his company, which at the time was called Big Top Peanut Butter, to Procter & Gamble. And Procter & Gamble reformulated Young's recipe pretty significantly. They used alternate oils to peanut oils in the hydrogenation process. Then they started adding sugar and molasses to their products. This new version of the recipe was rebranded as Jif, and competitors took notice. Soon afterward, other peanut butter manufacturers started adding sweeteners and non-peanut oils to their products. And then the Food and Drug Administration got involved. Uh, They were watching this kind of shift in peanut butter from being just peanuts and peanut oil to peanuts, peanut oil, other oils, and sugars, and they were not okay with a product that included non-peanut ingredients uh, being labeled as peanut butter. The FDA's stance was that a product needed to be 95% peanuts to be marketed as peanut butter. But 
Manufacturers, on the other hand, thought that 87% was a much more reasonable number, and thus began 12 years of legal back and forth about what percentage of peanuts has to be in peanut butter for it to really be peanut butter. Finally, in 1971, the FDA and manufacturers settled on 90% as the amount of peanuts a jar of peanut butter must contain. Yeah, and it was one of those things when I was doing my research, I didn't include it here because it gets very mathy in a hurry, but a lot of the arguments were like, okay, but if we include this many peanuts and this much peanut oil, then we don't have any space to put molasses in, so that's not really a workable recipe for us. Like, it was all sort of, a lot of their argument was science-based and, like, what could actually fit in the recipe and still make it palatable and competitive on the market and what consumers were used to eating. Um so since the 1970s, there have, of course, I'm sure all of our listeners will remember one or another uh, recall or a shifting health trend that have damaged one big peanut butter brand or another for a time. But peanut butter just as a food has really remained a staple in pantries, certainly throughout the U.S. and in other parts of the world. Yeah, I think one of the I know one of the reasons that we ate it so much as a child was that even uh, even though they were they were buying Organic from a food co-op, it was like not a brand of, it was like a, a, a tub of <laughs> industrial sized, super cheap, we can make a million sandwiches out of this peanut butter that had to be stirred together with a spatula. Oh yeah, there are so many tales of like, uh, you know, I'm sure anybody in their friend's circle will be like, oh, when I was in college and super broke, I would just buy like a jar of peanut butter and a loaf of bread and that would have to last me for the week. And even famous people often love to tell their like, I was so broke peanut butter stories that are basically the same story of this is what sustained me when I wasn't able to, you know, afford more um variety in my diet. So peanut butter has saved a lot of people from being hungry. That's for sure. Uh, and I thought to close out, it might be fun just to share a handful of fun facts about peanut butter. By the time he retired, to start off, Joseph Rosefield had 10 food patents. Yeah, he really did some interesting things in terms of the food industry. He paid his workers a lot more than than most other companies were. He invented the wide mouth peanut butter jar. Uh, he was very into uh, kind of moving and shaking and trying new things. Um, in 1937, the New Yorker published its first peanut butter cartoon, and that was, uh, by some, a sure sign that the product had become a cultural institution. To make a 12-ounce jar of peanut butter, you'll need about 540 peanuts. That's why when you mentioned earlier, if you saw my wry grin when you were talking about possibly experimenting with uh, planting peanuts, it's one of those things where you have to plant so many to get a little bit of a crop, so. Well, and if my uh, memory is accurate, we pretty much grew them and snacked on them. And it's yeah. entirely possible that I'm conflating them with some other root food that we grew. <laughs> uh, 1942 was the first year that hydrogenated peanut butter outsold natural peanut butter. And while peanut butter is often seen as a staple for people with limited budgets, fancy peanut butters are now a large part of the market, I will confess, I buy fancy peanut butter. I do sometimes, but every once in a while, um, I'll be on the peanut butter aisle looking at the sort of, you know, organics and the naturals, and I'll look at Brian and be like, not this time, I gotta go with the the old standards with sugar in them, because they are very delicious, and they're kind of, um, there's a lot of nostalgia that's part of it. Uh, one acre of peanuts translates to roughly 30,000 peanut butter sandwiches. About 80% of today's peanut butters are hydrogenated, and to be labeled as natural peanut butter, the product can contain natural sweeteners and salt, but no stabilizers. So that's why natural peanut butters often have to be um, stirred. And go in the Although now, now there are a lot, and I, I haven't looked into the science of this, but have you seen these where it's like, it's 100% natural peanut butter that you do not have to stir, like the label will state, like no stirring needed. And I've I'm seen like, that. How are they doing that? I have seen that, but I have not bought them because I I have this weird nostalgia for stirring the peanut butter because of my weirdo organic childhood. <laughs> uh, in 2013, Delta Airlines distributed 69.6 million packs of peanuts on its flights. Related to that and to what I'm going to say next, I was on a flight very recently where there were no peanuts served because there was someone on the flight who had a severe peanut allergy, and it turned out that was my seatmate. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, 
As many as six out of a thousand people in the United States have peanut allergies, which is really sad because in addition to the fact that it means you can't eat this pretty cheap and tasty staple, like often peanut allergies are just deadly, which is why they were not served on the entire airplane because there was one person with a severe allergy. Yeah, and it's one of those things I'm sure anybody who's listening that's dealt with a peanut allergy and even people that haven't probably know peanuts and peanut powder show up in some unusual places. It's kind of like gluten where you don't, it's not always in the places you automatically think it would be. So that it's very restrictive. It makes me sad because I love peanut butter so much. I wish everybody could chow down on it. Yeah. And I know that there are people who are really against the idea of banning peanuts from a place because of allergies, but seriously, an airplane. Like, what are you going to do if you have a medical emergency in the air? Right. <laughs> right. When you're trapped in a steel tube hurtling yeah. through space. Um, peanuts actually contribute more than $4 billion to the U.S. economy every single year. And Americans spend almost $800 million a year on peanut butter. Uh, the average American eats about six pounds. That's roughly 2.7 kilograms of peanuts and peanut butter products each year. I'm really quite confident in all seriousness that you could triple that number for me. <laughs> and we'll just leave that there. Well, and, so in my weirdo organic childhood, one of the things that we would have for a snack would be uh, some some peanut butter from the tub of peanut butter that had to be stirred together with a spatula, um, and and honey smashed together in a cup. Oh, yum! And eaten with a spoon. I still do that sometimes. Yum! And I I usually my breakfast lately has been peanut butter on a fruit. Like peanut butter on apple or peanut butter on banana. It's good stuff. I'm a fan of peanut butter. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcast at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.